Broadcasting live from the absence of wow, this is Pop Culture Reference, your one-stop reference for all things pop culture. I'm one of your hosts, Garrett Strother. And I'm one of your other hosts, Seamus Connolly. And today we are getting wibbly-wobbly, (laughs) timey-wimey with the Loki premiere, but first we're going to jump into some news, including uh, a follow-up on, you know, a couple weeks ago we talked about Donnie Yen being in the new John Wick Chapter 4 Joining him and Keanu Reeves is Pennywise himself, Bill Skarsgård. I think Bill Skarsgård is a wonderful actor. I feel like I've only seen him in a handful of things, but he always, he always I think, does really well. Um, I want to say Bill Skarsgård was in Atomic Blonde? Am I crazy? Is this going to officially... I don't remember him being in Atomic Blonde. Ooh, maybe I'm crazy. Hold on. Who was? Who would he have been? Not James McAvoy's character. Yeah, Atomic Blonde, Bill Skarsgård is Merkel? I, I didn't see it, but... Oh, I don't remember. I did see it, like, opening weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he's in it. Maybe, I, I remember, like, when that movie came out, there was a lot of speculation, like, oh, this is so John Wick. Is it in the same universe? Is it, like, a secret prequel or something? But... Well, it makes a lot of sense now that you bring up that he was in that movie that he's in John Wick Chapter 4 because there's so much of the same behind-the-scenes team oh, yeah. with those two films. And, you know, this is, again, like, John Wick specializes in, like, Eastern European bad guys. I assume he's probably going to come in as some adversary to fight, right? Yeah, he definitely has a has a bad guy feeling to me. I always think that Bill Skarsgård could have a Buscemi career, but... Oh, is it the eyes? It's the eyes, <laughs> It's the yeah. eyes. Oh, He's man. untrustworthy. <laughs> well, I, I I, definitely... I Maybe we should do a John Wick catch-up for this new one. I haven't seen any of the sequels, but I, I think I would really like them. I, I love that first one. I didn't see Parabellum. John Wick Chapter 2 was fine. Not as good as 1, even though... I think a lot of people would disagree with me on that. Yeah, I heard the second one was a little lackluster, but I know the third one kind of picked up a little bit of the slack because I think the same team as the first movie came back for the third one or something. Like, it was more specifically connected behind the scenes to that first one, but I... I like I said, I didn't really see the sequels, but... I, I mean, it's going to have John Wick going through a nightclub shooting guys in the head. Oh, then... yeah, there's going to be, like, weird stylistic subtitles that'll disappear until, like, the last second that for no reason appear and really hard techno the whole time. Yeah, I get it. I I always think, like, the best John Wick movie is the one scene in Incredibles 2 where they fight during the strobe light room. <laughs> yeah, that is spot on. I, I also say my favorite John Wick movie is the scene in... Uh, Kingsman in the church where he's just going off with the gun. Yeah, I get that. Does that is a little John Wicky? It's a lot more um, CGI infused. Yeah, that's than true. John Wick. Just that, just the quick I mean, gun work. Ooh, gets me every time. We have to talk about Blue Beetle being moved to HBO Max, which is weird. That is a little weird. You know, this was this was gonna kind of be like a pretty big release. I feel like you know, it's it's kind of a more obscure character that doesn't really get the spotlight as much but i think one that was going to really be very cool break a lot of barriers in the the dc verse at least but uh you know like you said it's a little weird that it's it's getting shuffled to uh, straight to streaming yeah i think that there might be a little bit of a racial double standard at play it just feels like they don't have faith in this character to do well, considering the fact that DC will put out literally anything, it seems like. Yeah, seriously. And, you know, the hype that I was getting built around this movie seems like me and a lot of other people, I feel like, are going to see this as, like you said, kind of like a, a, a bias on something that could otherwise be incredible. I mean, the lesser known heroes, to me at least, seem to be doing DC a lot of kindness, like with Shazam and... You know, a lot of the really cool cyborg stuff that isn't touched on in, like, the Teen Titans, when you look back at it, I this does rub me the wrong way just a bit. 
I know Diego over at Live Action Remake was pretty upset about it. He was tweeting out a bunch of middle finger emojis. I think rightfully so, man. It's 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 definitely it's a big screw you to us and like the Latin American fans that were really really looking forward to this as like kind of a big moment in representation for the DC universe, but I mean ugh, it seems seems tainted a bit now. Uh, Coming up next, we got news just today as of recording that Orson Krennic from Star Wars Rogue One is going to return in the Andor Disney Plus series. Ben Mendelsohn's back, baby, and I could not be more excited. I was going to say, he is such a good... uh, Like, something about him as, like, an Imperial higher up in Rogue One, like, it made me hate him in the most perfect way he, he's just so fantastic in that movie as as krennic I, i'm glad to see him coming back i think it's because and i in rogue one's a movie that i've really come around on and that i'm really quite fond of now even though i didn't really like it when it came out and but i've always liked krennic i've always been fascinated by krennic because he is really the imperial that has the most character behind him like there is humanity in him tarkin is just this cold military man this pillar of strength Mm -hmm. that's only obsessed with power and there's so much more humanity and complication i feel like behind the portrayal of krennic and that i mean obviously they have a actor the caliber of ben mendelson playing him so helps a lot but he brings so much moral complexity and almost a like inferiority complex to that character like he's overcompensating to me i i i definitely feel the same way it's like there's this personality in that character that it it almost reminds me of when you see you know in in a lot of the new lore and projects there's like inquisitors and like other sith lords that we see like really have more personality than just like i am evil for the Empire, whatever, whatever. He like he feels like there's a lot more emotion behind his actions other than, like you said, kind of Tarkin, who is just like as evil Empire as he could be. And uh, oh, do, do you think this means that we're going to get more CGI Tarkin in this, I in this really show? I really hope not. Me I too. really hope not, Seamus. I mean, I would love to see Tarkin again. I would just like him to be played by Charles Dance, please. Sure, I... that would be perfect. I think that would be perfect. Like, it, it kind of worked in Rogue One because I, to to me, I feel like that was the first time I saw a completely, like, CG character that it really made me do a double take. Uh, when you first see, like, uh, Tarkin just, stay, like, talking in the dark whenever he gets introduced. Um, but that really only works for, like, a split second or, like, a scene for the first time. You know, it's not going to have that same, even just impressive, like, wow, that really does look like him. It's just going to be maybe in poor taste and kind of creepy. Yeah, I watched that with my parents not too long ago, and I think it was Tarkin's second scene, and my dad was like, wait, Peter Cushing's not still alive. (laughs) Yeah, dude, it, it is truly impressive in that movie for sure, but once you get to, like, the super brightly lit young Leia moment at the very end, I'm like, oh, wow, this is weird. PS4 game. I have a lot less of a problem with the Leia moment than I do with the Tarkin, just because I feel like Leia, for one shot, is a lot different than a character that has to play off of other characters and emote and play... Like, he's there for multiple scenes, plus he's dead. Yeah, that's true. Which makes it feel ickier to me, even though I know they had the permission of Cushing's family and all that. But... I'm excited to see Krennic come back. I hope Charles Dance is is in this one. I'm curious to see how it plays out because I don't know how much um, Krennic and Andor know each other before mm. Rogue One. I don't know if they ever talk about that. I know, obviously, they in the moments before their deaths, they shoot each other. So that's That cute. is true. So, um, I mean, these characters do have kind of like a faded connection. Yeah, that, that, is, that is very true. They kind of like have a predetermined endpoint, I guess. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how they play with that in the illusion to like what's going to happen to them together and separately. So yeah, I'm thrilled by this news and I'm excited to to hear more from Andor because it should be coming out, I think, relatively soon. 
I would the, hope. These Disney Plus shows really sneak up on me, truly, but they're always they're always really impressive. So I'm I'm looking forward to it too. Uh, coming up next, we have the new Battlefield 2042 trailer and the announcement that it is coming out on October 22nd. Yeah, this one's going to be $60 on last-gen consoles, so PS4, Xbox One, uh, $70 on next-gen or current-gen, whatever, consoles, PS5, Xbox Series X. Multiplayer only, no campaign. It's going to have a Fortnite-style battle pass, and really interestingly, I think, it's going to be 128 player matches on PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC, but down to the standard 64 player matches on last gen consoles. And oh yes, there's one other thing. Um that battle pass definitely made me nervous uh considering it is multiplayer only and it's going to be a full price game, but I did later find out that the battle pass is going to be mainly cosmetic and that the new major content drops like the specialists and the maps will be free for everybody. So kind of like Fortnite and Call of Duty are doing. And uh, I also know that there's going to be those 128 player matches. There's going to be uh, options to play full bot matches. I think a lot of people are saying that that is what they wanted over like an actual campaign anyway. Just the option to play offline with the massive scale still. I mean, that makes sense to me. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, with the... You, you remember how fun... Battlefront 2 became when they implemented more bots into the multiplayer mode. Like, it's just, it fleshes out everything. It makes it seem bigger. You feel more badass when you, like, kill 10 bots in a row, and you're like, I know those aren't real players, but, like, that felt pretty cool. To me, it just comes back to, like, it, it's Battlefield 2042, and I feel like so much of, like, the other predominant first person shooter, Call of Duty, has been spent in this, like, weird, not-too-distant, dystopian techno future. Yeah, that's true. And everybody was really excited when they went back and were like, no, we're doing the past, we're doing the 80s, we're doing something different. And now Battlefield's like, oh, no, but we're just going to go back and we're going to go ahead and fill that market. Yeah, pretty... I mean, yeah, they've been kind of flipping back and forth. Like, the last couple Battlefields were Battlefield 1 and Battlefield 5, which was World War II. And, I mean, people were hoping for, because I know they did Battlefield 2242 or 2142 a while back, where it was, like, straight up future, and people were kind of hoping for that again, but, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, as somebody who is kind of a Battlefield fan, and I've, I've played the last two, I think it's, I'm very much looking forward to going back into the modern era, or I guess the distant future era with Battlefield, because I feel like they do it so much more interestingly than like their call of duty counterparts because then it's all just like exosuits and everything's kind of still the same yeah it's definitely a better implementation of it it's still just not something that very much interests me yeah that's fair i just i I, i've heard a lot about the uh map destruction mechanics and how it's going to be like every single structure in the map can be altered and collapsed in specific ways fitting your fight or something and Ooh, that really, that, that tickles my fancy, Garrett. I, I like that kind of adaptability in just like the middle of a game. Things can change like that. Yeah, I like that too. I think that's cool. And I think we're going to be seeing with this next-gen power, not only can we do things like higher resolution gameplay and having more players in a match, but we can do dynamic environments, and that is exciting. Yeah. You got controllable tornadoes in this for some reason. That's going to be wreaking a lot of havoc. I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm not super pumped about the, you know, seventy dollars for the one game mode, pretty much. But I, you know, I need to buy a PS5 still anyway. You just buy it used, Seamus. Facebook Marketplace will have it for fifty bucks two weeks after it comes out. Oh yeah, maybe maybe that'll be good. Uh, and and you know, knowing Dice, there's gonna be at least two weeks of bug fixing before the game is even playable. <laughs> so you know, I've got what? some time. No, we- not you think, dice. You think only two weeks? <laughs> oh, give it a couple months, maybe? Who knows? I mean, Battlefront, they took like a year and a half to get it working <laughs> yeah. properly, so... Well, that was a whole fiasco. I don't. I can't say much about that, but hopefully they learned their lessons. Maybe, maybe the multiplayer only will mean that they'll focus more before release. Hopefully. 
But our last bit of news is a pretty short, just little stop off in the music, into music. Lord, after a four year hiatus, has announced a new single coming out with Phoebe Bridgers, Solar Power. Awesome. I, I, like, for as much as I do not listen to, like, modern pop music, like, I kind of like Lord. Like, the, the singles that I've heard of hers are, like, surprisingly decent for somebody that you know, mainly listens to mall sounds and, like, 80s <laughs> garbage rock. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad she's coming back. I actually didn't know she left for four years, but, you know, I'm looking forward to checking this single out. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Plus, um, I know the album cover is kind of causing a stir on the internet. This For this single very, here? Yeah, it's a very, I, or, yeah, album cover, single cover, whatever you call it. It's on your it's on your phone, Seamus. Oh yes, please, thank you. It's got a very low angle of her in a bathing suit that people are having oh, a little moment over. Goodness gracious, yeah, that is that's not what I was expecting to open up my phone to, Garrett. So, a lot of people are making jokes about like they heard uh, that Lord heard Billie Eilish and Olivia Rodrigo were coming for her fan base, so she had to, <laughs> you know, God. strap back on the Infinity Gauntlet and finish what she started. <laughs> Well, hell, maybe they'll all maybe there'll be some inter collaboration going on here now that they're all kind of popping off right now. I mean, they got Phoebe Bridgers on this one, who I would say is definitely in the Venn diagram of Lord fans. So, yeah. Well, I, do, do we know when this is coming out? Just soon. The rumor is the end of June, but I don't think there's an official release yet. Right on. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll probably, you know, hopefully it's got a sweet music video we can we can bring it on back to the show yeah i'd love that all right well with that i think we should uh get into our main segment the premiere of the new loki series i am so jazzed to talk about it with you seamus all right let's do it we teased it last week and here is our official segment name for the new loki disney plus series loki doki so i think we should before we go into spoilers just give our general thoughts and then hop into spoilers. But probably most weeks when we're doing this segment, we're going to hop right into spoilers. But I think with the pilot, let's let's talk to people about, you know, whether or not they should watch it. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, I and I usually say this on the premiere of new Disney Marvel shows. I think this is the best Marvel thing I've ever seen. It's so it's it's got me man just the aesthetic of the time authority time variance authority the TVA. time variance authority i love love the aesthetic i love all the new lore we're getting i think maybe i just have a crush on tom hiddleston but then again who doesn't i'm thoroughly compelled and i have many theories that i want to go into with you later but at this moment i think this first episode is is really doing it for me all right calm down mephisto hey don't spoil my theories garrett (laughs) i too and this is not usually what i say during a marvel disney plus premiere this is fantastic yes and it's definitely the strongest of the three pilots so far in that it feels like, one, a full story being told. It feels like a full pilot. And two, it's a sh- it's a series that I would actually watch if it weren't Marvel-related. Like, if you showed me the WandaVision pilot or the Falcon and Winter Soldier pilot, I would not watch that show if it weren't Marvel. Yeah. And I would watch this 100%. It, it's such a... Because, you know, we got a little bit from the trailers, but this is so much more fun and complex and like weirdly engaging and all of just the minutia of the details of the new stuff that we're getting here it's great and i'm glad you i'm glad you're liking this one more than the other ones cuz it you know might even seem like more confusing and strange but it's like we're kind of getting this new loki that we're working with in this show that I don't know. It makes it feel like completely new, but also still like the follow up on these this character that I I very much enjoy a lot of. Yeah, and I want to break that down a little bit more in spoilers. But Owen Wilson, he's adorable. He's my main <laughs> man. He's not just doing 
Owen Wilson. Like, I feel like most of the time that I've seen Owen Wilson the last few years, it's just been like, oh, I'm doing Owen Wilson. Okay, I'm in a (laughs) rom-com. Man, okay. Oh, yeah. And this is back to, like, it's a role, and he's not just having to do his Owen Wilson shtick. And I love, I love seeing him that way. I mean, I have loved Owen Wilson since I saw Night at the Museum in 2005, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's where we all fell in love with Owen Wilson, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the man's a treat. And I, I want to shout out, you know, the rest of this cast, too, who I'm really enjoying so far. Um, Gugu Mbatha-Ra, who has been around forever and still looks the same She's the the <laughs> judge lady. She was in the newsroom, which I rec centered a couple months ago, and she was on that J.J. Abrams Undercovers show from, like, ten years ago. You remember that? Where it was a husband and wife CIA Oh, squad. yeah, yeah, I do remember that. She was also the main character in J.J. Abrams' The Cloverfield Paradox. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I like her a lot. I'm excited for her to have more to do. And, of course... We would be remiss to not mention Pill Boy. Pill Boy, dude. Hell yeah. Oh, man. Now, Casey is his, is his name. We won't get too into it now, but Casey may very well be Mephesto. And I don't have anything to back that up, but it's possible. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Oh, God. Well, I mean, I don't know what else to say besides I literally love everything about this pilot, and I can't wait for next Wednesday, but... Also, I think so far, if you're a casual Marvel fan, you're good going into this. Like, I think this is one that's really easy to follow because it is standing so much on its own premise, whereas I think WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier are shows that you probably need to remember a lot more details about the MCU to get into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, and, you know, not to get into it too much, again, before spoilers, but, like, they really do, if you are more of a casual MCU person, they do a lot of recap in this pilot here that will, like, kind of hit you on all the major points you'd need before they kind of get into the insanely confusing part of this, which, again, they kind of keep it as simple as possible for one of the more confusing aspects of the MCU. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm giving this my stamp of approval, but I think that's really all we can say before we go into spoilers. Yeah, I think so, too. So so what do you say, Garrett? Spoil it. Spoil it away, Seamus. I guess I should have said Loki Doki. That's probably what you were teeing me up. <laughs> yeah, I, was de- I definitely had that in mind. <laughs> God, I don't even know where to start. Pillboy has a drawer full of Infinity Stones. <laughs> so, yeah, that's an interesting thing where Loki... Okay. I think we need to backtrack a little bit to talk about the full implications of the drawer full of Infinity Stones. Okay, yeah, that's that's true. Casual Marvel fans probably needed to be reminded, which the show does right at the beginning, that this Loki is not the Loki that we know from Thor the Dark World and Ragnarok that got killed in Infinity War. This is all the way back to 2012 Avengers Loki who got pulled out of time during the events of Endgame. So... He has not experienced all of that sweet, sweet character growth that we are accustomed <laughs> to. And so it's a really like it's like unhinged villain Loki that we're starting out with in this series. But the pilot does a lot of work to kind of put you it's not by the end of the pilot, it's not just that character anymore because he has seen basically how the rest of his life would have unfolded if he hadn't been pulled out of time. Yeah, kind of hitting those big Loki moments throughout the MCU, like the death of his mother and kind of his responsibility for that death. And uh, also the death of his father, which I also guess he's responsible for. Jeez. Evil Loki. Indirectly responsible for. He put him there. He like kidnapped him and put him in an old folks home to wither away. Yeah, but, like, he didn't, like, decide that that... His decisions didn't lead to be that being the point where Odin died. Yeah, I guess, I guess. He still felt felt pretty raw about it. Uh, and then, of course, his own death at the hands of Thanos in Infinity War. Yeah. It's, so, uh, it's a very humbling experience for our evil Loki. He kind of he kind of gets a lot of that development in a in a quick snap. No pun intended. 
Oh, of course. I totally meant that, too. Yeah, it's a weird, like, in-between Loki that we're dealing with right now. But, of course, we know Avengers-era Loki is all about power. I mean, Loki in general is all about power. But that he's really chasing, like, the Tesseract. Loki just Loki just can't get enough of that sweet, sweet Tesseract, baby. <laughs> and that the way that he's finally convinced that the TVA, the Time Variance Authority is something that he might want to stick around for, is the fact that they treat the Infinity Stones like they're nothing. Literally paperweights in the office of the TVA. It also means that we could potentially be seeing the Infinity Stones get somehow reintroduced to the mainstream Marvel Universe, which I think would be a regression that I wouldn't care for. I almost think that this was their way of saying, like... Look, they're like, they still exist, but we're kind of done with the power that people are after here. Like, this is us saying that maybe they're not the next big thing anymore. Though it did occur to me that I really hope that we, in our dimension, time travel hopping, could potentially see Steve Rogers returning the Infinity Stones. That is something that I would really like. Oh, that could be fun. Loki bumps into time travel Steve Rogers or something. Yeah, I think that could be a really interesting little... A moment, especially because, you know, after Endgame, we all talked about how Red Skull and Captain America definitely saw each other again. And how and... that would be the funniest reunion. Yeah. That's another thing I saw people pointing out with those uh, Infinity Stones is that I think there isn't a single Soul Stone in the pile of uh, Infinity Stones. So That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I guess nobody's going to see Red Skull in a lot of timelines. So, yeah, let's talk about the the... What is it, the pure timeline? Uh, the sacred timeline. Sacred timeline. Yeah. That the... we get a lot of a lot of information dropped on us at the very beginning of this with a cute little Terra Strong yeah. voiced Miss Minutes sixties like Hanna Barbera cartoon. <laughs> yeah, like a yeah, Hanna Barbera style workplace safety video about a multiverse war, which is yeah. the coolest phrase. And, I mean, things like that have happened in the comics, to my knowledge, but I don't think there's, like, an ancient multiverse war in the comics that's referenced as explicitly as here. So, that's really weird. And then also the fact that all of time is now controlled by three deities who set forth, like, one sacred timeline, which, I mean, I kind of don't buy a lot of what that. I think, we're, I think we're supposed to doubt it, like Loki is. I like, who is, why do they have the authority? Who are they? Where did they come from? Are they celestials? Are they something greater than that? Are they, you know? Oh, maybe. I, I feel like that is just uh, one of the things they've done in this episode where it's just like, hey, if you think about any of this too hard, it will unravel. So we're just going to say... They were there during the war, and they took control, and they set it to one timeline. And that's like, just nah, bro. keep it keep it I, at that. I think they're the villains. I think that they didn't really create all the, all the TVA employees. I think that there's something darker going on. Honestly, I, I think, and now this is stupid a little bit, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Mephesto, but I definitely don't, <laughs> I definitely don't think... That it's as simple as just another Loki variant oh, committing these murders. Lie. Like, it's gotta be, you know, someone disguised as Loki, that little uh, French girl pointed at the devil in stained glass, which, I mean, definitely brings up Mephesto theories again, but I'm just saying it could just be somebody in with horns, I guess, that kind of resemble like Loki's yeah, horns. Yeah, exactly. Because they, if it's a hooded figure at the end of the pilot, if it was actually Loki, they would have probably showed us that it was him, at least. I don't know. I think there's something fishy going on. I don't necessarily think that Owen Wilson's in on it, but he could be. I and... hope he's not in on it. Oh, is Owen Wilson going to be Mephesto? God, no. no. I'd be so sad. But then again, Mephesto, Owen Wilson in later movies could be a lot of fun. I don't know. I'm just very, I'm very interested in the end game. No pun intended. <laughs> Going into this series of, like, I genuinely don't know where we're heading with this. We've got this interesting catch-me-if-you-can dynamic between Loki and Owen Wilson that I'm liking a lot. And I will point out that even though Owen Wilson didn't say wow, he did say, come on, man! Which is, <laughs> is definitely true. a staple of the Owen Wilson canon. <laughs> that is very, very true. 
I'm, 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 uh, as with all Disney Plus Marvel shows, I'm really already placing my hopes that some of my favorite characters don't die and that they can again return after they wrap the show. Owen Wilson is definitely on that list, but I feel like his earnest nature and his like kindness towards Loki is going to get him 100% killed by the end of this. Not necessarily by like our main character variant Loki, but I don't know. Also, can they die? They're not human, right? They were created well, by these time guys. That's the thing. I don't know if I buy all that. That's I don't know. I'm very <laughs> curious to see what what kind of plays into that. And I will say, I mean, you're saying like he's this ga- this kind-hearted guy but we don't really know a lot of what's driving him we don't know exactly why he wants loki to be spared during his trial we don't we just know he's a good detective who doesn't really play by the rules yeah that's true but like i feel uh, just the speech that he gives him he says like you only exist to allow others to become the greatest versions of themselves or something along those lines and, like, just kind of the demeanor he has, like, compared to maybe the other higher-ups at the TVA who are just trying to straight up, like, disintegrate him at one point, like Liz Lemon's agent in the beginning there. Yes, I was, <laughs> I was, I was also going to bring that up, too. I, lo- I was hoping he was going to be the buddy in this series, but he got straight <laughs> up, he got straight up scorched. Kind of like, um, in Ragnarok, they, they incinerate people like that. Oh, yeah, they do kind of do that. I really like the design of all the, the gear and the weapons. The TVA itself is just, like, such a cool design in, like, the architecture and the people that are there, too. It's It really tickles me. That it's a 60s fever dream? <laughs> yes, that's all. That's what I'm all about, dude. It's It's what if Loki went to the game Control, which was one of my rec centers a couple weeks ago. It's, it's perfect. Speaking of what if, I feel like... Oh. There is so many places they could be going with this. That is a great thought. Because, man, oh man, I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff of, like, how is any of the stuff that happens with the Avengers and time travel, quote-unquote, legal at the TVA, but the one thing that Loki did to spark the events of that time travel is considered a crime... See, that's what I'm saying, man. It's, it's all it's sticky, man. It's it's not to be trusted. I I I'm not buying the TVA's <laughs> authority. I'm not. I don't think those big timekeeper boys are on the up and up, Seamus. It's what I've been preaching. Oh boy, it's it's Galactus in three different masks. I mean. <laughs> I don't know. It. I for some reason I trust them so implicitly, which is probably my mistake. But I feel like. The TVA is so straightforward. Like, they don't ever put on airs about anything, you know? They're just like, if you don't take a ticket like a deli, we're going to disintegrate you and... Yeah, they're a fascist state, Seamus. What? They're... Well, yeah, a little bit. I don't know. They're, they're, they've they're got some good stuff going on there, I think. They're, then again, they are like... When, when they reset a timeline with that cool, like, hourglass bomb... That's really cool. Yeah. That's just killing everybody in that timeline. No, it's resetting them. It's resetting them back to where they were. Okay, all right. That like, that before is Loki showed up or whatever. What I thought. Good. Okay. I'm just saying, Seamus. Like you know, first they came for Liz Lemon's agent, and I said. <laughs> <laughs> then they came for Pillboy and his cart, and I said nothing. <laughs> oh, Pillboy always gets the short end of the stick. He doesn't know. Casey doesn't know what a fish is. That's pretty fun. That's I, really funny. I yeah. bet that's gonna come back later in a funny way. Well, I was I was hoping that he was going to say, like, try to use fish, but have the context be incorrect. <laughs> oh, I guarantee that happens in the next couple episodes. But I am thrilled that he's in this. I mean, I am... Anytime Eugene Cordero shows up, he's just my favorite part of anything. So He legitimately does really play the same character every time, but he plays that, like, kind of naive, nice person very well. Because, okay... What he, he might be honestly like our most talked about actor on this show. <laughs> He's just in everything. Because he was in Mandalorian, he was in Good Place, he was in Kong Skull Island. Oh yeah. I mean, the dude man works. He cannot stop working. Seriously. I 
and like you said, he's so good in everything he's in. Even if it is like a smaller, shorter role, he always kills. He's always good for a good laugh. But yeah, I'm thrilled to be covering this week to week. We're going to be back every single week with a Loki recap here on the show. Loki Doki, that's going to be our segment name, as I said at the top. And, you know, like, I'm really interested to see where they go with this. I think it's going to get weird fast. Yeah, definitely not in the way we were probably intending from the trailers. But, I mean, yeah, it's going to get, it's going to, on those timelines are going to unravel when, like, whoever's stealing those reset bombs is going to go go off, you know? What happens the if the TVA thing- is attacked with those time bombs? Who knows? Oh, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I like the way that they use time in this already. Like, I think, you know, there might be a cultural appetite for that after the success of Christopher Nolan's Tenet of the idea of Mm. time manipulation as a form of combat, which this show executes really well. Oh, definitely. Those slow-mo batons and the, the time collar that's on Loki is pretty choice. I will say, the one thing I didn't like about this episode is the fact that the D.B. Cooper thing felt so out of left field and so specific. Yeah. I just, because they showed that in the trailer and I think you and I kind of assumed that it would be like part of his job with the TVA to go back and he has to be D.B. Cooper for some reason, you know, who knows why. Yeah, D.B. Cooper time crime. It would have been great. But he's like, oh, it was a bet with Thor. And I'm like, what was the bet? that instigated that (laughs) i do like the idea that just like a casual most likely drunk bet between heimdall and thor and loki involved the consequences being go to midgard and hijack a plane steal two hundred thousand dollars like it's 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 funny stakes but i i wish that db cooper was time crime instead but yeah it could be Who, who knows maybe they'll go back it is time travel it, yeah, it'd be cool if it came back in a better way, but right now it just feels like something to put in the trailer so that people are like, oh, I know D.B. Cooper. Yeah. Also, considering, like, I know a bit about the D.B. Cooper files, and they transcript of what was said in the actual events, like, wrote that into the script. Like, everything that happened in specific order and through, like, every eyewitness account, it was incredibly accurate to what like, was actually said and done on that plane, but then it was kind of just, like, a throwaway. So, who knows? I hope I hope that detail and, you know, attention to the minutia of everything in that wasn't just for kind of a gag. Well, the writing on this show's been good enough so far that I'm willing to put a little faith in the writers to bring that back. So, here's hoping. Here's hoping. Oh, you know what? I just had a thought. Maybe we'll get more flashbacks, and it'll be Loki through history just, like, screwing around, and the punchline every time will be, like, I lost a bet with blank. Maybe that'll be something, but... That could be something, I guess, yeah. Uh, if it get... pays... It. Again, it has to pay off in some way, though. Like, it, I don't True. think that'd be very funny if it's, if it's just a running gag. Yeah. But, you know, we th- this is the pilot. It's They've got infinite space to have fun with that kind of stuff and i've got faith that they'll bring it back you could say that they have infinite space time Time? soul (laughs) mind and the the other one reality the red one. reality yeah the one from thor the dark world man that movie's a lot more important than it should be considering the fact that it's not very good yeah, dude, I just rewatched that one again it it was it was kind of better than i remember because of the importance they put on it in endgame but yeah, not the best. But, like, when that movie came out, everybody was like, man, that just was a movie that didn't matter, and now Marvel's like, but it matters a lot. And everybody's like, I didn't see that one. <laughs> the two movies I didn't see were Iron Man 3 and this one. Yeah, oh, God. Making people care. But should we move on to our pop culture reference, Seamus? Yeah, let's do it, Garrett. So for today's pop culture reference, we're going to be talking about something that was actually referenced on this week's episode of Loki. D.B. Cooper, one of the most famous and mysterious crimes of the 20th century. The case of D.B. Cooper has been examined and conjectured by countless government agencies, detectives, and authors. Back on November 24th, 1971, a man named D.B. Cooper boarded a plane from Portland to Seattle with a single black briefcase, and while in the air, after ordering a, a bourbon and soda, slipped a note to the flight attendant, revealing his plot. 
Then he had to verbally, just like in the show, confirm that he in fact had a bomb in his briefcase and that he demanded $200,000 and four parachutes to escape the plane. Reports from all eyewitnesses corroborate this and that he was calm and confident and that after the plane landed, unloaded most of the passengers and brought him his demands, they took off again and he leapt from the plane with the money and two of the parachutes, never to be seen again. Absolute Chad, my God. <laughs> uh, many people have theorized and investigated as a lead in solving the identity of D.B. Cooper, but to this day, no one has been officially charged with the crime. Bank notes actually batching the serial numbers that were given to Cooper were found in the Columbia River in 1980, and despite the resurgence of interest and a uh, continuation of the investigation, it only deepened the mystery and there were no actual answers that were gained from this discovery. To this day, the FBI refuses to officially close the case entirely and is still searching for the truth in hopes of new physical evidence to come to light. Uh, that officially makes this a 50-year-long running manhunt as of right now. Yeah, books, movies, and TV shows have all used the story to create like humorous and dramatic representations of D.B. Cooper, and the legacy and the mystery have turned into this kind of folk legend. One of the popular landing sites of Cooper in Ariel, Washington, has a town-wide celebration called D.B. Cooper Days. There was speculation for a while that the main character of Mad Men, Don Draper, was actually going to be a D.B. Cooper fictionalization. And obviously, most recently, Loki came on to be D.B. Cooper on the new premiere of Loki. So that's kind of a fun and fresh way to expound on one of the most interesting and long-running criminal mysteries in American history. Yeah, I, I actually don't think we mentioned this uh, before, but the bomb that he brought onto the plane in his briefcase actually turned out to be completely fake and actually built mm -hmm. out of household items. So honestly, in my mind, this makes D.B. Cooper the single coolest criminal in modern history, just because he, he like didn't hurt anybody, did a completely awesome Point Break style skydive with a duffel bag full of money. It's, I, I love this story. And I think that you know, I hope to see more of this in Loki and that it wasn't, like we were saying before, just a throwaway. But, you know, the legend of D.B. Cooper and the fact that it is still a complete mystery, I think, means that we won't really be seeing an end to these interesting takes on the story. I mean, I definitely love it as a folktale, and I think it's an interesting fictionalization choice in things like, you know, Loki. But, I mean, Seamus, there is something to be said for the fact that he probably gave those pilots and flight attendants permanent ptsd yeah maybe he was so cool though he was ordering bourbon and soda he was wearing sunglasses he just like leapt from a plane i i like to believe that he was like winking at people like loki was in the, in the show i'm just saying yeah it's probably cool not cool. 70s airliner <laughs> doesn't make it any less of a hostage situation <laughs> yeah he really did take a bunch of civilians hostage didn't he yeah I mean, oh, great. I, I definitely get the allure of it, and it's something that's been romanticized, I would say, definitely in our culture, because there's so much interesting aspects of, the, there's so many interesting aspects of the case, and I think there's definitely a romanticization of, like, air travel in that era anyway. Mm -hmm. Plus, something I hadn't clocked until just now, the fact that Loki is so clearly trying to emulate this, like, 60s, 70s, catch me if you can style demeanor and like kind of tone that db cooper representation within loki definitely lines up with like the style of catch me if you can absolutely i, I totally see that but he more than likely died jumping out of that plane is what a lot of people think so you know maybe he just ended up dying from a jumping out of a plane we'll probably never know to be honest so god that eats at me i, I want to know so badly but but yeah, that is our pop culture reference this week. Garrett, what do you say we head on over to the rec center? Loki dokie, Seamus. I got it this time. I got <laughs> it. Now it's time to save the rec center, where we bring you our weekly recommendations. Seamus, are you ready to go? This week, I was, while watching Loki, fully reminded of another like eerie sci-fi concept that takes place in like a super sketchy cool 60s office 
Uh, a while back, I saw John Frankenheimer's 1966 film Seconds, and it's so much of that same kind of just like creepy 60s office aesthetic. You know, a company that you're kind of being surrounded by knows more than you, but they're trying to make you feel really calm about it. And it's it's super, I don't know, it just, I, I was very much reminded of it watching Loki this week. And uh, it, it's, it's like this weird science fiction drama, like all black and white about this guy who gets like recruited by a weird company and... He's sold this package where he gets, like, plastic surgery and a new life based on what this company is offering. Because he, like, hates his wife and he, he he's miserable in his own life. And it's just this weird psychological science fiction drama about this man who has, like, a new life out of nowhere from this creepy company. And I, it was one of my favorite films that I saw in that semester. I know that much. And I, I highly recommend it. I, I also think it's on criterion if i'm not mistaken so you know it's you know it's got something you know i'm only familiar with that in the context of i know it was a big inspiration on the total recall movie like the original paul verhoeven arnie schwarzenegger oh one. that makes actually complete sense so yeah but i mean i wouldn't be surprised if it were an actual influence on loki now that I'm kind of connecting those two dots, thanks to you, Seamus. I mean, it really could be kind of like the idea of alternate identities and having multiple of the same characters. Maybe, yeah, these variants kind of coming into play with that idea of identity crisis and, you know, kind of handling your own life. I I would love to find that out, but I guess we'll have to keep watching Loki to figure it out. Absolutely. What do you got this week in the rec center, Garrett? So while you tied your rec center into this week's show, I'm tying mine into next week's show. Right now, you can go stream on HBO Max the new film In the Heights. You can also go see it in theaters, and I really can't recommend this one enough. It's just thrilling, good, summertime, fun. I think it's definitely the best Warner Brothers HBO Max movie that's come out this year, and I think I've seen all of them actually because right i even watched that angelina jolie firefighter movie <laughs> what? okay and i mean it's just a thrill i really like it plus we're covering it for the show next week so go watch it so you can listen to us talk about it yeah man i've heard nothing but incredible things about that from like the early screenings and like since it's been out i love lin-manuel miranda and i know this movie was like such a long time coming so I'm I'm thoroughly excited to take that recommendation and and be ready for next week. Yeah, I I can't wait to talk about it with you, Seamus. All right, with that, I think it's time to wrap up the show. You can find us on social media at PCR underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. You can email the show at popculturereferencepod at gmail dot com. Uh, find us and like us on Facebook. Hit up our YouTube channel for all of our full episodes and other great content find us personally on the internet find us personally in real life if you can uh <laughs> yeah that's all i got what do you think garrett i, I think that's a great wrap-up seamus i will see you next week adios amigos